So my name is uh, Kevin Sawinski, and I'll be your speaker um, for the first about two and a half hours this morning. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a topic that uh, probably, in terms of exam preparation, scares a lot of people, uh, perhaps especially the biostats piece of this, and uh, I'll do my best to try to demystify that a little bit. Uh, just to give you some perspective about where I'm coming from in terms of this talk, one, I'm not a statistician uh, and, and don't have uh, any graduate training in statistics or anything of that sort, so I'm coming as an applied user of, uh, of statistics. I'm a former item writer and uh, BPS council member for pharmacotherapy, I certainly don't know what's going to be on this exam. It's been a long time since I've been on the board, but I'll try, be, try to give you per, some perspective about what things I think are important. Uh, and uh, so I think it's time to get started. I don't have any conflicts uh, related to this presentation, and I'm certain you can't see those in the back, but uh, they're in your book, and uh, we'll uh, try to cover these uh, throughout uh, throughout today. All right, so, so what is this and what isn't it? Well, this is not an exhaustive review of biostatistics. It is what the, the workbook says it is. It's a refresher on biostatistics. Um, some of you may come uh, with uh, more of this material than others. And uh, so we'll try to cover what I think is important for this exam. Uh, but again, it's, it's not meant to be an exhaustive review. We'll talk about uh, what I think you need to know, uh, and then we'll go through uh, specific topics related to, to biostatistics in, in an effort to, uh, to prepare you for, uh, for the exam. I know some of you are here recertifying, and uh, just as a general disclaimer, most of what I'm going to talk about is really focused on those that are, that are sitting for, for the exam. All right, so, so what is statistics? There's a cartoon out there that, uh, that I didn't put in here that describes this, um, that, that stats is a means for collecting, classifying, summarizing, and analyzing data. Demystifying, probably not. Maybe it uh, makes uh, interpretation of uh, the data by some even more challenging. Uh, we'll see that it's uh, useful for quantifying uh, clinical and laboratory data in a meaningful way, and it assists in determining whether or how much of a treatment or procedure affects a group. So we'll talk about inferential statistics, that is, using statistics on a sample and then applying that to a larger group, which of course is a major piece of, of stats. So why do pharmacists need to know stats? Well, hopefully it's obvious to this group, uh, and uh, we'll talk about what we need to know. So I think this is a pretty good primer on what tests I think you should enter this exam at least being familiar with. You're certainly not going to have to do them, uh, except perhaps calculate a mean and a median and probably not a standard deviation, but a range. Um, you're not going to have to know how to do the others, but you're certainly going to have to recognize them. All right, and if you're interested, you can see the reference that this comes from this would be a good place to start. And we'll go through most of these in the remaining 70 or so minutes. Why should it be important to you now? 25% of this exam covers stuff that we're going to talk about today. All right? 25%. There's some additional uh, things such as drug information topics that we're not going to cover. Uh, there are some research topics that likely we're going to run out of time. You have a full slide deck with about 140 some odd slides from these two presentations that we're most likely not going to get through all of them, but you have the slides, you have the handout. Um, that's about 25% of your exam. This is my third uh, trip through these slides, uh, first to the PEDS group, second to the, the AMCARE group, and your advantage over AMCARE is this only counts for 14% of their exam, but they have to know it all anyways. All right, so 25%, I think that's a good number. I was really excited when I found that out when I took this exam a long time ago. 
All right, so let's get started with uh, data first, and then we'll talk about statistics. All right, so we're going to start with discrete variables because they're the most basic. So these are variables that can take a limited number of values within a given range. And the two that are shown on the slide that are most commonly discussed are nominal and ordinal um, variables. So nominal variables are yes, no type of variables. And you can see on the slide that uh, classifying someone into either male or female sex would be an example of that. Describing whether, whether they're alive or whether they're not alive would be an example of a nominal variable and then whether or not a disease is present or absent. Okay, so um, no indication of relative severity, yes, no type questions. Ordinal extends this a little bit more, and now we're speaking of ranking, okay, ranking variables in a specific order, but with no consistent magnitude between the ranks. And the, the New York Heart Association functional classification for heart failure is an example of a commonly used uh, ordinal type of data. So individuals are ranked via symptomatology, one being no symptoms, four being severe symptoms. Okay, the magnitude of difference between one and two is not necessarily the same as between two and three. All right, so nominal and ordinal data. Continuous variables, on the other hand, are counting variables. They can take any value within a given range, and there's two main types of scales. There's interval scale, okay, in which data are ranked in a specific order with a consistent change in magnitude, but the absolute zero value is arbitrary. The most common example of this is degrees Fahrenheit. Contrasting that with ratio scale data, now there's no arbitrary zero point there's a fixed absolute zero. Okay, it's the same as interval. The example of this is the other temperature scale, degrees Kelvin, which has an absolute zero. And many common clinical measures, heart rate, blood pressure, time, distance, are examples of, of uh, ratio scale data. Right, we're gonna talk about two types of statistics. Statistics that describe and statistics that make inferences, i.e. descriptive and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics are used to summarize, and I know I'm not supposed to use this word in the definition, but I am. They summarize and describe data that are collected or generated in research studies, and they're done either visually or numerically. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, are statistics that are used to make conclusions or generalizations made about a group, okay, from a sample of that group. You want to say it in statistical jargon, made about a population from a sample of that population, okay, because we obviously can't, we can't study the whole population. All right, we're going to start with descriptive statistics, and there's three ways in which to show data, and three of them are, there's more than three ways, but three of them are shown on this slide. One is a frequency distribution, two is a histogram, and three is a scatter plot, which the last one I'm certain everybody's pretty com comfortable with, but seen here is a frequency distribution showing frequency <clears throat> of data points, and the data points are anti-factor 10A concentrations. And what we're going to do at some point is to figure out whether or not this frequency distribution, okay, is normally distributed or not. Or we'll do this with a similar type of data set, okay? So this is why it would be useful to, to look at um, these types of, uh, of figures. All right, let's talk about uh, numerical methods to describe data. And we're going to start with measures of central tendency. So we have three measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. And I think the mean is one that, that most everyone is pretty comfortable with. You will almost assuredly have to calculate a mean or interpret a mean on this exam, all right? Uh, more likely, you're, you're gonna have to interpret and you're gonna be tested on whether or not you know that the mean should only be used for continuous and normally distributed data. All right, it should not be used for other type of data. 
The reason for that is it's very sensitive to outliers. It tends to be pulled towards the tail of a distribution in which there are outliers. All right? We've just described it's probably the most commonly used and, and well understood um, me measure of central tendency. The median, also known as the 50th percentile, is the midpoint of values. If you put values in a row from smallest to largest, it's the middle value in that distribution. If you have an even number of data points, then it's the average between the two middle values. All right, it's used for either ordinal, okay, like the New York Heart Association class classification, or like a Likert scale, uh, or continuous data, all right, especially in the case where there's skewed distributions. It's relatively insensitive to outliers, all right, so it's not going to be pulled towards uh, the point of that distribution in which there's an outlier. The mode is the most common value in a distribution, and it can be used for any of the three types of data that we've discussed, nominal, ordinal, or continuous data. Some other facts uh, relative to mode that are, that are illustrated on that slide. Uh, distributions can have more than one mode, and those are termed bimodal or, or trimodal distributions. All right, how do we quantify the spread or variability that exists within uh, an individual data set? Well, the standard deviation is one means to do that, and that's a measure of the variability that exists about the mean in a data set. And the standard deviation, like the mean, should only be applied to continuous data, underlined for emphasis, Okay, standard deviation should only be applied to continuous data that are what statisticians will refer to as approximately normally distributed. All right, and, and we'll talk about how we can figure out whether or not something is approximately normally distributed. Uh, recall uh, something maybe you've heard about or not heard about or care to forget about something called the empirical rule. The empirical rule is a, a rule that states that because a mean and a standard deviation defines a distribution, that 68% of the values that were collected and described by that mean and standard deviation fall within plus or minus one standard deviation. 95% within two, 99% within three. So those of you who remember that first organic chemistry exam that you took, uh, I got a 25 on mine, and I got a B. <laughs> well, that's because I was in this second set of standard deviations, right? Um, so empirical, empirical rule is useful. It's not really a useful tool to use in the classroom to grade, but uh, it was in my organic class, so... All right, coefficient of variation is another term that I think is important for you to recognize. It describes or relates the mean to the standard deviation of a sample. All right, and you can see the formula, the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100%. And then lastly, the variance is the standard deviation squared. So, so you could be expected to perhaps have to go between these three measures, all right, and know how a variance relates to a standard deviation know how a coefficient of variation relates to a standard deviation. The range, on the other hand, is pretty easy. If, if you can do subtraction, you can calculate the range. It's the difference between the smallest and the largest value in a data set. Okay? You could perhaps be expected to do this, but maybe not expected to calculate the standard deviation on an exam. Uh, it's very sensitive to outliers, obviously, because it's going to extend the complete data set. It's often reported as the actual value, okay, rather than the difference between the two extreme values. Percentiles are related to the range, and they're a point on, in a distribution in which the value is larger than some percentage of other values. For example, in the, if we describe the 75th percentile of a data set, 75% of values are going to be smaller than that 
that particular point on the distribution. Okay, and this particular uh, measure does not assume a population has a normal or any other distribution. All right, in contrast to what a standard deviation, uh, what the assumptions of a standard deviation are. Uh, one of the commonly used uh, related terms to the range is the interquartile range, which describes the 75th, I'm sorry, the 25th to 75th percentile, or the middle 50% of values in a data set. All right, so the interquartile range. All right, so uh, you'll, you'll probably find by the end of this two and a half hours uh, maybe a little bit less use of your cards than, than you may see in some other talks. Uh, but we're going to start with uh, an application type question, and all you need is your green or your red card. So this is a paper that we published uh, uh, about uh, five years ago in which we asked some, question, some PharmD students in our biostatistics class some questions about how we were doing. All right, and we, in that particular question, we asked them to, like you're going to be asked to do in a, in a couple of days, or actually tomorrow, is uh, provide some feedback to, to the presenters. And we asked questions about examination questions, and we asked students uh, to, um, to answer based on a Likert scale. Okay, one to five. Strongly ag disagree, we were doing really bad strongly agree we were doing really, really well. So you can see over the first three years of the course, 2006 through 2008, um, this is the average, about two and a half, and it increases with time. The, the median in the interquartile range is shown below. So, so which of those, the mean in the standard deviation or the median in the interquartile range is the most appropriate way to represent the central tendency and dispersion of that data. Mean for green, median for red. Okay, a lot of people aren't playing this morning. They're still drinking their first cup of coffee. I thought somebody was gonna put a blue up. They wanted uh, a different answer. All right, so the correct answer in this case is the median in the interquartile range. All right, uh, that's because the Likert scale, like the New York Heart Association functional classification, is a ranked scale, but the difference between one and two is not necessarily the same as between two and three. So you might ask, well, why the heck did you publish both in this paper? Well, because a reviewer told us we had to. They told us nobody is going to understand what a median is, so you show us the wrong thing. All right, so we had to show both. Um, there, there is some controversy in the statistics literature. Yeah, I read a little bit of the stats literature um, about Likert scales and the use of means, but I don't want to confuse you and go there. So in this case, median is the most appropriate way to, to represent these data. All right, so let's summarize what we've talked about relative to, to measures of data spread and variability and central tendency. All right, whenever we read papers, we should look for both a measure of central, central tendency being presented as well as data spread and variability. So what measures of central tendency should be presented with continuous and, or in, continuous interval scale data should be means or averages. With ordinal data should be medians. Could be modes as well. And then what measure of spread and variability should be presented with means should be the standard deviation. With medians, it should be the range or the interquartile range. All right, so again, continuous interval scale data, we want to present the mean. Ordinal data, we want to present the median, or we could also use the mode. Uh, in terms of spread and variability, we present the standard deviation with the mean and the range or the interquartile range with the medium. It makes absolutely no sense to present data as the median and the standard deviation. Makes absolutely no sense. Um, so mean, mean with standard deviation, median with range. All right, so look, let's look at an example. Um, this may be a perfectly uh, 
uh, fine example for something that you might be expected to do um, on this type of exam. So one would be to calculate the mean, the median, and the mode of the above data set. And these are 20 HDL concentrations that were, that were obtained from a small study relative to the consumption of, of red wine that was being studied in that particular study. Can you do this? And I think most of you can do this, um, hopefully. Can you calculate the range, the standard deviation, and a concept that we haven't discussed yet, and we will, the standard error of the mean. And we'll talk about how the standard error of the mean differs from the standard deviation. And then evaluate the visual presentation of, of these data. All right, so I've done that for you. You can practice at home. The measures of central tendency are all shown here, the mean, the median, and the mode. And the mean and the median are pretty close to one another. And we'll use that concept in a second to help us to figure out what this distribution is likely to look like. I've calculated the standard deviation, which is a little bit challenging to do on an exam without a, uh, a scientific calculator. And so I don't expect you'll be asked to do that, but perhaps evaluate that concept. Then the range and the interquartile range um, is also calculated. Standard error of the mean I've done for you. Again, we're going to describe that in a second. So let's evaluate the visual presentation of these data. All right, I'm not going to ask you this question yet. I want you to think about, this is a, a, a similar frequency distribution histogram that, that we looked at before. This uh, shows the HDL concentrations on the x-axis and the frequency of occurrence of each of these concentration ranges on the y-axis. And we're going to eventually answer the question, hopefully, as to whether or not we think this is normally distributed. Okay? Think in your own mind uh, whether or not it is. And we'll come back to that in, in just a second. So we're going to switch to inferential statistics and then apply inferential statistics to our, to our data set um, in just a second. All right, so we said inferential statistics. We're, we're making, we're using our sample to make conclusions about a larger population that that sample was taken from. All right. Uh, we'll talk about how we choose and evaluate statistical methods relative to that. Okay? And uh, we can do statistical inference by a couple of different ways, either by estimation, that's by using confidence intervals, or by hypothesis testing. Okay? And that would be by showing p-values. Um, and we'll talk about both of those means, both of those ways. Both of those means is not a good way to say that. All right, so we're going to start with uh, uh, the population distribution that everyone's most familiar with, and that's the normal distribution, or sometimes referred to as a Gaussian distribution. It's the most common model. It's symmetric. It's bell-shaped. Again, just like back to that organic chemistry uh, exam. There are some important landmarks, statistical landmarks, statistical jargon. The population mean of that distribution is equal to zero, and it's denoted by the Greek letter mu. All right, the population standard deviation is equal to one, and it's denoted by sigma. And then the sample mean, x bar, or little x is shown here, and little s represent the, the sample mean and the standard deviation. Okay, and a picture of it looks like that. Again, with the mean in the middle of this distribution. And uh, just like we've talked about relative to the number of standard deviations away from the mean, that's what the picture looks like. All right, so we're going to go back to our HDL example. And I've superimposed a normal distribution on that histogram. And so we're going to ask the question, do you think by a show of green that this is normally distributed, by a show of red, uh, by a show of red, no, by a show of green, yes. All right, as I expected, there's, the, there's a mix, probably a little bit more green than red. Um, and so let's try to answer this question. By looking at it, my first gut reaction would be yes, okay? That data set is approximately normally distributed. Remember, this is, this is 20 samples, 
Okay, pretty small sample size. And we're, we're trying to figure out if, if, it's, if we can make the assumption that it's normally distributed. So how do we do that? Well, we should look at the picture like we've just done. Two, the easiest way to do this okay, is to compare the mean and the median. And we've done that. And the mean and the median, in this case, is 61 and 60.8. Those are pretty close. All right, so that's my best guess at, at the fact that these are normally distributed data. We can do a formal test that uh, my students in stats class used to refer to as the vodka test, the Komolgorov Smirnov test, okay, which is a formal test to, uh, to determine whether or not something is approximately normally distributed. Um, and I would conclude based on uh, this and the picture that we looked at before that, that these data are approximately normally distributed. If you actually do this test, that test would be a, in agreement with that assumption. All right. Remember, I hate to mention uh, pharmacokinetics because that's maybe the topic that scares people second most besides biostats and clinical study design. But just like the clearance and the volume of distribution define the pharmacokinetics of a drug and what its profile looks like, the mean and the standard deviation are parameters that describe your data set. All right? Which is why we call them parametric tests, because they have some underlying parameters that describe their distribution. All right, so let's just add to the confusion about standard deviations and, and variability and, and introduce the term the standard error of the mean. All right, so the standard error of the mean is defined as the standard deviation divided, divided by the square root of n. All right, and, and by definition or by by math, that's always going to be smaller than the standard deviation, right? The standard error of the mean, as opposed to the standard deviation, the standard error of the mean quantifies uncertainty that exists about the mean, not about the variability that exists in your data set, all right? Quantifies uncertainty in the estimate of the mean not in the variability of your sample. So it shouldn't be used to describe the variability in your sample. Why is it worth uh, knowing about besides this factor, the difference between standard error of the mean and standard deviation? Well, the application of it is, is we use the standard error of the mean to estimate confidence intervals. And a 95% confidence interval is approximately the mean plus or minus two times the standard error of the mean. All right, it's actually 1.96. You might remember that back from your stats class. Uh, but we approximate two because, well, it's easier. Oftentimes, the standard error of the mean is used deceptively to make data look a little tighter than they are. And here's an example of that. And it's not a great example. It's from our HDL example again. Um, so which of the following, this is HDL concentrations, and this is the data represented as, represented as the mean plus, or, or plus the standard deviation. This is represented as the mean plus the standard error of the mean. Which of those two, orange or yellow, and I won't make you raise your cards, is the appropriate way to, to represent that data? And the answer is um, by the orange, uh, the orange bar, all right? You can see, in this case, it's not a, it, there's not huge variability in the data, but uh, often individuals use this deceptively to make their data look uh, a little bit tighter than it really is. All right, this segues nicely into confidence intervals. Uh, recall that 95% confidence intervals are typically the most commonly reported confidence intervals. And what that means uh, in... Uh, in non-stats jargon, is that if we were able to do repeated samples in that same, from that same population, 
then 95% of all confidence intervals would include the true population value. All right. Why are 95% confidence intervals most oftenly reported? Because that corresponds to a p-value of 0.05. All right, so 95% confidence intervals are used for that reason. There's a, 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 an example of calculating a confidence interval that's shown here. I'll let you work through that. But I will warn you that uh, uh, the concepts, I, I think the testable concept in this case is, is that standard deviations and standard error of the means and confidence intervals are often used interchangeably, incorrectly, by individuals. And so the, the concept here, the testable concept, is to be able to, to sort out the differences between these, what they are, and be able to interpret those. So we can use confidence intervals in, instead of standard hypothesis testing. And standard hypothesis testing, perhaps like you did back in your stats class, involves uh, hypothesis testing with a null and alternative hypothesis and then a calculation of p-values to tell us whether or not a statistically significant difference exists. Okay. But what it doesn't tell us anything about is what's the magnitude of that difference? Right? We just get a p-value. Maybe it's got 55 zeros and we're really impressed by that. But it doesn't really tell us anything about what's the, the real-life application of that difference and what's the, the actual difference. So, that, so that's what confidence intervals do. They provide us with an idea of the magnitude of difference, perhaps, between two treatments. If we're looking at in our statistical evaluation, the difference between two continuous variables. Let's say we want to evaluate LDL concentrations in two groups. Okay? When, we, when we set out to design our study, if it's two drug therapies that we assume are, are similar, then our hypothesis would be that there's no difference between those two groups. Right? So our confidence interval is set up such that if or our, our test is set up such that if our confidence interval includes zero, i.e., no difference, then we would conclude that uh, there's no statistically significant finding. All right? And the p-value associated with that, all we can tell is it's greater than 0 0.05. There's no need to show both the 95% confidence interval and the p-value. All right? They both do their jobs independently of one another. And in the second uh, part or second section of, of this morning's, we'll talk about confidence intervals for odds ratios and risk ratios and, and how they differ from the example I just gave. All right, so, so hypothesis testing, just as a general and basic review, Obviously, when we, when we design a, a research study and we set up a, a, a hypothesis, generally speaking, the null hypothesis describes no difference between the two comparator values. In this case, treatment A is equal to treatment B. We set the alternative hypothesis then to state that there is a difference. So treatment, e, treatment A excuse me, is not equal to treatment B. We do our statistical test, okay, and the results of that statistical test will indicate whether there's enough evidence, okay, to reject the null hypothesis. And if the null hypothesis is rejected, then we conclude that there's a statistically significant difference. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, then we conclude that there is no statistical difference. Okay, and remember, we're not we're not concluding that the treatments are equal, all right? We're concluding that uh, there's uh, either a statistically sig significant difference or no statistically significant difference. Now, some may argue, okay, well, what about an equivalence trial or something along those lines where our conclusion's a little bit different? I'll let you uh, sort through that information. We're just going to hit, we're just going to touch on it very briefly. In fact... Table four in your handout describes different types of hypothesis tests. 
non-directional, directional, and I'm going to let you, for the sake of time, review that information. And again, we'll come back to it in the second half of, of the second presentation uh, to discuss these factors a little bit more. Not much more, but a little bit more. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about, or at least start to talk about, statistical tests and how we would choose a statistical test given a specific set of data. And, and the, how we choose a test is going to be dependent on a variety of different factors. One is, what do the data look like? So what I promised to do, and of course what I forgot to do, was, was to tell you that if you're interested, and I have no uh, uh, financial stake uh, or other stake in this textbook. I'm not an editor, not an author. This is offered by ACCP. It's called the Clinical Pharmacist Guide to Biostatistics and Literature Evaluation. And why am I talking about it now? Because I just jogged my memory about. But it, basically, this, this text has several chapters and then lots of questions, multiple choice type questions that, that go through some concepts. But wh why am I talking about it now? There's also a couple of flow diagrams in this text that are perhaps different than the one that I've provided in the handout. And some may like that better than that what I've described. So if you're interested, it's, it's outside. I don't know, it's, it's around $30. I don't know exactly what the cost is. But it's useful. All right, so how we choose a test depends on the type of data. Is it nominal? Is it ordinal? Is it continuous? What's the distribution of the data look like? Is it normally distributed or is it not? All right, so we've talked about these two things. What was the study design employed? Was it a parallel group design or was it a crossover design? Talk a little bit more about this in the second half. We'll talk about some of it now. Was there confounding variables? Do we have to make some adjustments statistically? to our data because of the, the nature of the data that we collected. And then lastly, are we conducting a one-tailed versus a two-tailed test? And in, in most cases, a two-tailed test is going to be used. In fact, the New England Journal of Medicine does not even allow individuals to present data from one-tailed tests. Um, so we, we're not going to talk any more about this. Um, uh, and lastly, uh, what about parametric versus non-parametric tests? So remember that parametric tests, parametric parameter, assume that the data being investigated have an underlying approximately normal distribution. All right, so that's the only time parametric tests are appropriate, that the data are continuous. Well, they have to be, they have to be continuous to be normally distributed. Uh, and that the data being investigated have variances that are approximately equal. And we're really not going to spend any more time on this fact. It's maybe statistics 201 instead of 101. Um, but uh, you should be, uh, have at least in your mind, cognizant that that's the case. Contrasting that for non-parametric tests, they don't assume these, these same um, assumptions. There may be some other assumptions that are necessary for non-parametric tests but not that the data are normally distributed, and generally the data don't have to meet other criteria. So I had people come up to me at the end of this and say, well, let's just use non-parametric tests all the time. Then that's all we have to know, right? Well, non-parametric tests are less powerful if we should be using a parametric test. All right, so non-parametric tests are less powerful if we should be using a parametric test. All right, so let's talk about parametric tests. So I, I'm not sure if everyone has heard the story or not about why a student's t-test is capital, but it has to do with a Guinness brewery and uh, the fact that a student worked at, at the Guinness Brewery and didn't want to use his own name when he published this test, so he used student, all right, and he capitalized it. So that's why students uh, is capitalized, and that's a true story. You can look it up. It's not just urban legend. Uh, now, there are three types of t-tests. 
one sample, two sample paired. So we need to sort out the differences between these because this is a major focus to make sure that you understand the differences between one sample, two sample, and paired. So, so let's look at one sample first. So here's the example for a one sample test. As you leave the room today at, at about 11.45, you're going to consent okay, to a 5cc blood sample. All right? And we're going to measure your LDL cholesterol. Not really. All right. All right. We want to know if the LDL cholesterol of this whole group is different from that of the United States population. So that's the example of one sample as compared to the known population mean. Okay. We know what the average cholesterol concentration is in the US population. We're going to compare our value to that. All right, so this particular technique would be useful in determining clinical hospital laboratories' normal values. All right, using a normal distribution, using the distribution and the spread of that data, that's, that would be what this is useful for, amongst other things. Okay, what about a two sample test? All right, so, so as you leave the room, the women are going to be on this side, the men are going to be on this side, each are going to have blood samples taken, and we're going to compare those cholesterol concentrations between the men and the women in the audience. All right, those are two independent, different people in each group. All right, and we're going to compare the LDL concentrations between group one and group two. So independent, often called two sample, unpaired, or independent. Those three things mean the same thing. All right, just to add a little bit of confusion, um, this is really, this is in here for your information primarily. I, I can't fathom you'd be asked a test. Technically, when we compare those, concentrate, those LDL concentrations between the two groups, the assumption to use an independent samples t-test is that the variances between those two groups is the same or approximately the same. All right? If it's not, then we have to, have, we have to use an unequal variance t-test, which is really just a correction. Now, all statistical programs, when you run an independent samples t-test, they do both of them for you and you just have to figure it out. All right, I, I don't think you'd be tested on that, but uh, it's here for your information just in case. All right, what about a paired t-test? All right, so, so three months ago when you registered for this class, you had your LDL concentration obtained. Today when you walk out, we're gonna do it again. Now we have a sample at baseline when you registered, and we have a sample today. And we're going to compare to see if your preparation for today changed your LDL cholesterol. All right, so that would be measurement one when you registered versus measurement two today. So we're comparing in the same individual two different measurements. All right, so this would be uh, the simplest example of a crossover type of design. Right? Two measurements, a before and an after. Paired t-test. Sometimes these are called matched t-tests. Okay? But paired is, is the most common, commonly used nomenclature. All right, so the bad thing about a t-test is that it's only useful for two groups. All right, if we have three groups... Let's say we want to know if the LDL concentrations in this quadrant, this quadrant, and that quadrant are different. Well, we can't use a t-test. We can't say one versus two, two versus three, three versus one. That's multiple t-tests, and that's one of the most common errors in the literature. So what do we do if that's the case? We use ANOVA. All right, so now we have three groups. All right, we're extending 
our unpaired t-test to include three groups and we compare the means LDL here, LDL here, LDL here. All right, we generate one p-value. We can infinitely expand on this discussion. All right, we can add a factor. All right, we want to know if those less than 40 and those older than 40 here in, in this factor analysis and then the similar groups, one, two, and three. All right, and we can keep going and going and going and going, but we won't. Similarly, we can extend a paired t-test, all right? And this would be called repeated measures ANOVA. So you had your blood sample taken when you registered, you had it done today, and then you have it done six months from now. So now we have three measurements in the same person. That would be repeated measures ANOVA, and it's, again, an extension of a paired t-test. So when we do ANOVA, regardless of, of what the type of ANOVA that we do, but let's focus on a, a one-way ANOVA because I think that's the one that you, that you probably have to know. Um, what happens when we compare group one with group two with group three, we generate one p-value. We don't know if this group is different from that group, if that group is different from that group, or if that group is different than this group. Okay, we have to do post hoc tests all right, to make that determination. And we don't use multiple t-tests to do that. We use these po post hoc tests which maintain our 5% error rate, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, and these are, th these are four examples of, of post hoc tests that would be appropriate. Yes, this actually says the Tukey Honestly Significant Difference Test. All right, that's the most simplistic of the test, Bonferroni and Schaffé are, are two a little bit more conservative approaches, and they just control our error rate and prevent us from making uh, a, a mistake in terms of our statistical inference. What about non-parametric tests? So, so each parametric test has a non-parametric cousin, all right, that's related. So let's go through uh, each of those uh, particular uh, cases. The first, test for independent samples. All right, so, so these are the cousins to the independent samples t-test. So our example of comparing the men and the women in this group in terms of LDL cholesterol. There's two that are shown here, and these two tests are exactly the same. They were developed by two different individuals at the exact same time and published in different papers, but they're the exact same test. The Wilcoxon ranked some test and the Man Whitney U test, sometimes represented as the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test. All right, all together. So these are for comparing two independent samples when the assumptions of a parametric test cannot be met. All right, Wilcoxon ranked some Man Whitney U test. For ANOVA, the extension is the Kruskal Wallace one way ANOVA by ranks, and this is for comparing uh, three or more independent samples. As you would expect, there's also some tests for paired samples. And usually, what confuses people is that Wilcoxon's name you can see is in both of them. All right, so you should look in this case for the word sign. Sign, either the sign test or the Wilcoxon signed rank test. This would be useful for comparing matched pairs when the assumptions of a parametric test cannot be met. And then repeated measures ANOVA, the extension to repeated measures ANOVA, excuse me, the, the cousin to repeated measures ANOVA is Friedman's ANOVA by ranks. All right. Okay, and the lastly, related to nominal data, and this is something that, that uh, you will encounter frequently, uh, nominal data, often baseline characteristics data, 
in which we want to know if, if the percentage of smokers in one group is similar to the percentage of smokers in another group, we would use chi-square. All right, we're comparing proportions between two or more groups, and we'll go through some of these examples in just a little bit. The Fisher's exact test is a correction to a standard chi-square test in, in which there's a very small number of observations that are being compared, specifically less than five, and so there's a correction to that test that has to be made to, to prevent from making an error. So we'll, we'll talk about some examples of this both in this first section and then again uh, in the uh, second uh, presentation this morning. In fact, we're going to talk about those now. All right, so, so this is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine late last year related to a new monoclonal antibody being added to statin therapy and compared to placebo uh, of that uh, monoclonal antibody plus statins in another group. So you can see that, again, this new drug plus statins in about 1,500 patients. Second group is placebo plus statins in uh, almost 800 patients. And the design of the study is not necessarily important, except that this is a parallel design, right? We have two separate groups. Uh, individuals receive only one therapy. Again, this new drug plus a statin, this placebo plus a statin. And this table shows baseline characteristics, all right? The percentage of men and women in each group, percentage of smokers, in each group, then the baseline and the final LDL cholesterol um, in each group. All right, so, so let's ask some questions relative to this and try to sort out some, some information. So we want to know uh, what is the appropriate statistical test to determine if there are differences in the distribution of sexes between this group and this group, the LDL cholesterol concentration between this group and this group, and the percentages of smokers and non-smokers between this group and this group. All right, so I've purpful, purpose, purpfully, purposefully asked these questions in a little bit of a different way to get you to think about how these types of questions could be asked. All right, so first, What's the appropriate test to determine baseline differences in sex distribution? All right, so the, your potential choices are Wilcox and Sign Rank Test, Chi Square Test, 2A ANOVA, two sample T tests. And if, if my colors don't correspond correctly to your cards, I apologize. All right, uh, so go ahead and raise your cards. All right, so we have mainly reds and uh, a couple of uh, smattering of yellows and uh, perhaps uh, a couple of greens. So the correct answer in this case is the chi-square test. All right, the correct answer in this case is the chi-square test. So, so what are we really doing is we're comparing the proportion of smokers in this group I'm sorry, the proportion of men in, sorry, the proportion of men, I've just given the answer away to the next one, proportion of men in this group to the proportion of men in that group. All right, and that would be done with a chi-square. The next question asks, what would be the appropriate test to determine baseline differences in LDL uh, cholesterol? All right, same set of responses. Go ahead and uh, raise your cards. All right, I see mainly yellows in the group. Good, that would be the two sample t-test. All right, so now we have two samples. We have two independent groups. New drug plus a statin versus placebo plus a statin. All right, here's a I don't know if a statistician would be unhappy with me saying this, but I'll go ahead and say it anyways. If you don't see a mean, if you don't see a mean, you shouldn't use a t-test. 
all right? If you don't see a mean or an average, you shouldn't use a t-test. So you don't see a mean here. You don't see a mean here, right? You shouldn't use a t-test for those comparisons. In fact, you can't use a t-test for those comparisons. I mean, it, if, if, you, if you had the formula for a t-test, it was pretty easy, and you stuck a proportion in that formula, well, you could calculate it, I guess. But from the standpoint of an independent samples t-test, well, you need a mean to make that calculation. All right? All right, so we already know the answer to this one. This one's also a chi-square test. Okay? All right, uh, I asked this question yesterday and then confused myself during the second presentation and asked it again. So uh, I'll go ahead and ask it now. All right, so what if we wanted to know, and this isn't in your book, what if you wanted to know what was the impact of the new drug on LDL cholesterol, so we're only focused on this group, okay, forget about that group, what if we wanted to know, we only had one group, we wanted to know if those baseline and final LDL concentrations differed. Now, my sixth grader could look at that and say, well, yeah, Dad, those are different. Okay, but statistically, how do we figure out if this is different from that? All right, so I'm going to go to the question again. This isn't in your book, but we're going to use the same exact uh, answers. And, and here's the, the change to my question. Okay, you can still respond A, B, C, D, but if you want to respond E, just raise your hand. Okay, so A would be green, B would be red, C would be blue, D would be yellow, or raise your hand for E. And then some brave soul has to tell me what the answer would be. So go ahead, raise, raise your cards or your hands. What would be correct? Wow, really, nobody wants to play. Because nobody wants to answer the question. All right, so yesterday, I had some pretty uh, astute people actually answer A. Okay, so the correct answer is E. All right, paired T-test. All right, paired T-test. Right, because... These are matched people. Those measurements are obtained in the same people, twice. All right, so the astute uh, individual in the room yesterday said, well, that's the only choice I have on this, uh, the Wilcoxon sign rank is the cousin of the paired t-test, right? So if that's all you were given, then it's a reasonable response. All right, if, I'm, if, I've conf if I've confused you, come see me after, and I'll do my best to unconfuse you. All right, well, I just asked this question, didn't I? All right, so, so let's go to this one instead. So what's the appropriate test to determine the 24-week change in LDL cholesterol? 24-week change in LDL cholesterol. So what do we want to know? We want to know if this final LDL cholesterol, 48.3, is different from around 119. Okay, so what's the appropriate test to, to do that with? And uh, yellow is correct. All right, so two-sample t-test is appropriate in that situation. All right, so uh, in the remaining 15 minutes or so, we're going we're gonna, to uh, finish with a, a collection of, of different topics uh, related to stats, talk about correlation and regression a little bit, and then talk about uh, survival analysis. All right, so really, really important concept, type 1 and type 2 errors, and estimation of sample size is, is what we're going to talk about in the next several uh, Slide. So, so remember that the probability of making a type 1 error is known as the significance level or the alpha error. 
Okay, and by convention, a priori, meaning before we do the study, by convention, that's set at an alpha value of 0 0.05, and that's what the statistical gods um, think is best. Okay, so that's what we do it. Not really. So what does that mean in English? 5% of the time, 5% of the time, we conclude that there is a statistically significant difference when one does not exist. So this is a bad mistake, right? This changes practice. This changes how we use a new drug, right? Imagine the new neprilysin inhibitor just approved for the treatment of heart failure. Imagine that there was a mistake made and now that drug's going to be is going to become commonplace in the, in the use of heart failure, but we made a mistake. So we're changing practice with that mistake. Right? So we, want to, we don't want to do that, and that's why this error rate is set so low, 5%. After we do this study, the actual calculated chance that a type 1 error has been made is called the p-value. And if it's statistically significant, well, that's going to be less than 0.05. Right? Now, I had a statistics instructor when I was in Memphis tell me, stop being piggish with your, with your zeros. Meaning, don't, all you need to represent is a couple of zeros in your p-value, p less than 0 .001. You don't have to show 55 zeros. Okay, because it doesn't tell you anything more about the importance of that difference it only tells you that it's less likely to be attributable to chance. All right, so lower p-values aren't more important. They just tell us that our, our difference is less likely to have happened by chance. All right, so that's an, that's an important concept. Type 2 errors, on the other hand, by convention, and these are changing depending on the type of study design that's employed, by convention, are set somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2. All right, because this is a less severe error. In this case, we conclude that no difference exists when one truly does. All right, so we're not changing practice when we make this error. All right, type 2 error by convention, somewhere uh, around 0 0.2, uh, 0.1 to 0.2. Related to a type 2 error is power. All right, so power is 1 minus beta, the error that we just described on the previous slide. All right, and it's our ability to detect differences between groups if one actually exists. A common error that uh, students uh, uh, and residents make that, that I talk with is when they're analyzing a study, they, they say, well, there was a difference between these groups, okay? But this study wasn't very powerful because it was small, all right? Well, if there is a statistically significant difference that's observed in a study, that study was powerful enough to detect that difference, all right? Power is dependent on the following factors, uh, the alpha, those two things are intertwined with one another. You can't have one without the other. The sample size, of course, as sample size increases, power increases. The size of the difference between the two things that you're trying to detect. All right, if you're trying to detect a smaller difference, it's a heck of a lot harder to do that. And then lastly, the variability that exists in the data that you're assessing. All these things are intertwined in the estimates of power in a, in a study. So power can be decreased by these things that we discussed above or by poor study design or by using incorrect statistical tests. So if we use a non-parametric test when we should have used a parametric test, that test is going to be less powerful. We've talked about all these things, so, <clears throat> so I'm actually going to go on to the next slide. Uh, we've just discussed those, those factors. 
All right, another kind of tricky thing that, that often shows up on specialty exams is trying to sort out your understanding of clinical versus statistical significance. And unfortunately, these are kind of gray type areas. And, and if you want some examples, these, this book has some really good examples of that fact. So let's just spend a little bit of time on this. Um, one, we, we talked about bullet point one, that is the size of the p-value is not necessarily related to the importance of the result. Statistical significant doesn't necessarily mean clinically significant. We see these in, this in studies all the time. Very small difference that's observed. It's statistically significant, but maybe not clinically important. The opposite of that is also true. If, we, if statistical significance is not found in a study, that doesn't mean the results aren't important. It just means perhaps there, wasn't, there weren't enough people that were studied. So in uh, studies in which there are non-significant findings, we should consider sample size, what the power estimates were before the study was conducted, and then the observed variability that, uh, that uh, is observed in that particular study. All right, we're going to spend uh, maybe eight or ten slides on correlation and regression. Very powerful and related terms uh, before we conclude this, this, first, uh, this first session. So to summarize or introduce these terms, correlation examines the strength of association between two variables. It does not assume we're trying to predict one variable with the other variable. Regression does. So correlation assessed, examines or assesses the association between two variables, where regression actually uh, seeks to make predictions based on one variable and how it affects the other. So the most commonly used correlation is the Pearson's correlation. Pearson's is a parametric test. P, Pearson's parametric. Parametric test that assumes both variables are normally distributed. Okay, underlined again for emphasis. They, it assumes that both are ratial or interval scaled. And it assumes that the two variables are linearly related, not nonlinear, not some other uh, relationship, but linearly related. And it's often referred to as the degree of association between two variables, and again, does not imply dependence. One variable is not necessarily dependent on the other variable. Pearson's correlation coefficient, or little r, all right, little r, uh, ranges from negative 1 to plus 1, negative 1 being a perfect negative linear relationship, plus 1 being a perfect positive linear relationship. There's hypothesis testing that can be done in this particular case to determine if that correlation coefficient is different from 0. All right, but that test is highly influenced by sample size. All right, so if you have lots of people, the chances of finding a statistically significant correlation are much higher. The non-parametric correlation is Spearman, Spearman's rank correlation. This would be little r uh, superscript s, little r superscript s. Um, so the assumptions that we talked about are not necessary when using Spearman's rank correlation. All right. So here's a, a, a picture of what we've just talked about. Uh, positive 1, okay, perfect. This is the x variable, this is the y variable. Again, no independent or dependent variable. We're just looking at an association. Perfect positive correlation, shotgun blast. No relationship between the two variables, and then this is a perfect negative linear relationship. A couple of pearls about correlation. 
talked about number one before, the closer R is to one, whether it's positive or negative, the more highly correlated these two variables are. Unfortunately, there's no consistent interpretation of values of R. That is, I can't tell you, you know, if R is greater than 0.6, then that's a really good relationship. Or right, you kind of have to make that decision on your own, and it depends a lot on the study that's being employed and the situation, the place that it's being uh, employed. Pay more, pay more attention to the magnitude of the correlation coefficient than the p-value. All right, if you have a statistically significant correlation, but your R value is 0.2, who cares? All right, so pay attention to the correlation coefficient as opposed to the p-value. But most importantly, look at the relationship between the two variables. Now, if you're presented with a paper, sometimes it's hard. They don't give you the, the relationship. But if you're doing this yourself, you should always look at it first. Regression analysis is related to correlation. And there are many, 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 many different types of regression. And we're just going to look at simple linear regression in which there's a continuous outcome or dependent variable and a continuous independent or causative variable. All right, this is the most common example of, of regression. And there are two main purposes of regression. One is to develop a prediction model. All right, and two is to assess the accuracy of that prediction. So develop a prediction model and develop the accuracy. Again, regression makes predictions. Independent, de independent, dependent variable. The prediction model is listed here. It's the most basic one that we all know, probably from grade school and, and high school, and that is y equals mx plus b. All right, simple linear regression in which we're trying to make predictions of y from x, and the parameters of this equation are m for slope and b for intercept. All right, what about accuracy of prediction? So this is the, I think, really highly testable uh, concept. Again, in this book, there are some examples of that. There are some others in, the, in your workbook. So uh, the coefficient of determination is the estimate or the parameter, r squared, that's calculated in this case. It can range from 0 to 1. And uh, an R squared of 0.8 means that 80% of the variability in Y is explained by X. Okay, 80% of the variability in Y, the Y variable is explained by the X variable. So let's take a look at what this means in a picture, and I'm not going to necessarily go through each of these questions for the sake of time. But this is anti-factor 10A concentrations versus anoxaparin dose. All right, the individual uh, circles are the data points, and the solid line is the fitted linear regression line through those data. You can see the equation of the line here, which shows the slope as 0.227 and the intercept is 0.097, R squared value of 0.31 which was statistically significant. So based on this R squared value of 0.31, we say that 31% of the variability in anti-factor 10A concentrations are described by anoxaparin dose. So not very good, right? So lots of other things impact 10A concentrations than just anoxaparin dose. That's a pretty small sample size. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what that R-squared tells us from these data. Now, we could make predictions about what doses we need to use to achieve certain 10A concentrations, all right, just by looking at, uh, at these figures. And we're not going to go through that mainly for the sake of time. All right, we're going to conclude this first sec session with survival analysis in several slides. So survival analysis studies the time between entry into a study and some event.
deaf, MI, whatever. Now, the difference between survival analysis and everything else that we've talked about is the concept of censoring. Right? So when we use survival analysis in these types of studies, individuals can enter a study really at any time uh, during the study, and then they're studied until they, they have an event. All right? So censoring makes these survival uh, methods unique, and we don't have to necessarily enroll everyone at the same time. All right, individuals are enrolled as the study moves on. I think the most common uh, survival analysis that, that you've likely seen and read about in papers is the Kaplan-Meier method, which simply uses sur survival times to estimate the proportion of people who would survive for a given length of time. And we'll look at a picture of this in just a second, doesn't make any statistical comparisons between those survival distributions. We have to do that with an additional test. The log rank test can be done to compare these survival distributions between two or more groups, or the Cox proportional hazards modeling approach can be used, and this allows us to evaluate the impact of covariates on survival in two or more groups. So what does this look like in a picture? Again, really common, I think, highly testable concept to, to understand what this actually means. So this is hemofilter survival, okay, over time in individuals who were treated with bivalirudin or with heparin. All right, heparin shown in the dark, bivalirudin shown in the uh, in the the hatched or the light. You can see the statistical test that was performed using the log rank test which uh, allowed for the calculation of a hazard ratio and a 95 percent confidence interval was which was pretty close to being statistically significant uh, with a p-value of, of exactly equal to 0 0.05 okay all right I think we've talked about most of this but Cox proportional hazards modeling is the method that now allows us to evaluate the impact of covariates on this procedure. Okay, allows us to investigate several variables with time and ultimately with a calculation of a hazard ratio, a confidence interval, and then some uh, method of, of determining statistical significance. 